where we are looking at sex as as an act of, of, of pleasure and that we're for especially for women or vulva owners as I say that they understand that they understand their body I mean we're walking around with these bodies that we just do not understand and even men men have penis challenges they don't want to go to their doc they don't want to talk to their friends about their sex life they don't want to have their doctors about their penises not all men but many of us it's just like it's too shameful but it's our friggin bodies Emily welcome to at the end of the tunnel it is such an honor to have you on here and to hear more about your story you are someone who who inspires me. I watched your masterclass <laughs> on sex and um, yeah, and, 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 and I've been doing some research on your story and I'm really just intrigued by a lot of the, the choices that you've made over the years. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. I know you worked with Barbara Boxer and Pelosi and, and, uh, and Willie Brown. What did you glean from your time in politics that kind of informed your path later? Um, in politics, I learned, um, well, I remember, it's funny, I remember seeing Barbara Boxer speak. So I, I drove to, I drove to San Francisco when I graduated from Michigan and Barbara Boxer was running for Senate. It was her first campaign for Senate. And I remember I was an intern. So I went in to her first event and I saw her speak and she got up there and spoke about politics and rights and America. And I'd never heard a, a political speech like that. And I remember tears came to my eyes. I remember just going, I was like 21 years old, like, wow, this is a powerful woman. And she's, she's speaking to my soul and there's so much change and we can do it. And I got very rally, excited about the, the cause of the movement for people's rights and for all income families and, and diversity and fair pay for, you know, women's rights and women's, all the things. I got very motivated. And so I was really into the policy part of it. And just, I really enjoyed going around and speaking to different groups about voting. I mean, I was an intern at the time, but I was very like driven. So I was very like, I showed up every day, but this is what I found. If you're an intern, this is a great message of interns are listening. Like you be, make yourself indispensable indisposable, indispensable, I guess. And you just, I showed up, I would do anything. Like I will clean the tables. I will sweep the office and I will call people for money. Like, I'm like we're calling from the Barbara Boxer campaign. So I did everything and it was a thrill. Also working in politics is thrilling. There's a campaign, there's a deadline. Like my adrenaline junkie, me loved that we were all working towards this goal. And I really got to learn San Francisco. So we would drive to different parts of the city and knock on doors and ask for you to do the um, get out the vote efforts. And so I loved that part of it. And then I got offered a job. So then, and then I worked for really, so there was a bunch of things that happened. They wanted me to move to DC to work for her DC, but I had just gotten to San Francisco and I wasn't ready to go. And then I got a job working for another woman in San Francisco who was the first openly gay member of the Board of Supervisors. I ran her campaign. And then Willie Brown was the first black mayor of San Francisco. And he was a legend in San Francisco. I mean, he had been in, this, in the state house for 32 years as a speaker. And, and I got a call from his campaign, like, do you want to work on the Willie Brown campaign? It was a, and San Francisco is a very small town. It's sort of like a small nation in itself. It's less than a million people. If you work in politics, you know everybody. Um, and it was a, it was like you could really make change. And it, it was just a, a small a, a smaller group of people. You could have a big impact. And so what, I guess what I learned is like I learned about connection and communication. I learned about being able to talk to anybody about anything. And I think it even, I'm not, I can really, I love connection. Like my favorite thing, and people still laugh at this, is to walk into a room where I don't know anybody. And I've constantly put myself in situations throughout my life where I'm like, I'll go to this place where I don't know anybody. Even in high school, my brother went to one high school and I chose the other one at first, but that didn't, whatever. Like I just always want to do what people aren't doing. So I, with Willie Brown, like I love being able to talk to groups of people about why they should vote for him. Anyway, I, lo I loved the ability to get people to think differently about things without judgment because I'm so I'm not like an angry person. How I get messed around, I'm not like a um, divisive person. I don't enjoy argument or conflict. I'm also conflict avoidant. But I think I know how to meet somebody and how to hear them out and listen. I learned how to listen. I learned how to, to, to make change. But then I, so I did that for, I was in politics for 10 years. And there was a bunch of other things. I could talk about it forever, what I did. What I, did. I, I find it really interesting. And it was very pivotal in my growth. 
but I, I also sort of towards the end of it became sort of disillusioned with politics because so much of it was about raising money. And then you see like everything, the shadow side is like these candidates have to get up every day and they have to like kiss babies and shake hands and raise money. And I kept getting pushed towards that part of it. Like, well, can we get this donor and this thing? And they get a point in these certain commissions. So just kind of like everything that we know about politics. And I just thought this isn't, this isn't filling my soul anymore. This isn't doing what I thought it would, what it would do, make me happy, which we know nothing's going to make me happy unless it comes from inside. But at the time I was like, I'm not interested in this anymore. But I learned how to communicate, how to make change, how to be bold, how to be aggressive, how to get how to get anything done. I think I really learned that anything is possible because Willie Brown was such a, a mentor. I mean, all these people were. If you become a politician, you have such a work ethic and you also know how to get things done. Maybe you're a little manipulative. Maybe you're a little like you just everything's possible. The rules don't apply to you. You can walk on water. And I, working for people like this, this other woman I work for, like, there was, you can't take no for an answer. So everything is possible. And I learned to pull off amazing feats working mm. for these people. Like, things that I were impossible. I would, like, Willie Brown, is this interesting? Like, I haven't talked about this. Yeah, I'm curious what's an example of an amazing feat you pulled exactly. off. So Willie Brown was got elected mayor. And so he won. It was exciting. And he said there was like 50 of us on the campaign and he took 10 of us to city hall. He said, I want 10 of you to be on the transition team. And I was like 25 at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want to do an inaugural ball for the entire city of San Francisco. And I want everybody to be invited, but we don't have a budget. And I was like, <laughs> okay. So I went around to every single food service restaurant vendor in San Francisco. We got the entire port of San Francisco port, I don't remember what it was. One of the ports. I lived there for 20 years, but I can't think. Like, Pier, the Pier. Pier something donated their whole space. Mm -hmm. And I went around and I spent like six weeks getting all the food donated, all the singer. All, I, I basically coordinated this entire event, the inaugural ball, that everybody in San Francisco was welcome and invited to come to an event. And there was no cost. And that was stressful and intense and amazing. I remember big trucks rolling in and my mom was came to, I think I was talking to my, no, maybe there was no cell phones, but I don't, maybe she was visiting me because there was no cell phones, but she watched me like these U-Haul trucks coming in. I'm like this way, you know, I'm like a five foot one, like tight, like I come and I just coordinated this entire event to happen. But there were several things like that, that I, I would just, I did events for him where people would show up. It was like, 300 people. I think Maya Angelou spoke. She did speak, but it was like raised $30,000 for him. But I did no, like I got everything donated for the event. So that kind of stuff that I wouldn't have known how to do. I just made it happen. Did he have full confidence that this could actually happen? Or was he like testing you to see if you could actually make it happen? I don't I'm trying to remember. Like, and it wasn't just me, but I was in charge of the inaugural committee. So yes, he we had people, but no, I I think that he was just like, yeah, anything's possible. That's why he's so successful, because right. these people are like, everything is possible. I don't want the citizens of San Francisco who live in the Bayview, who live in these areas that can't afford tickets, to be left out of this momentous occasion. And I think that if maybe looking back, if I'm like, these people need money, and I'm sure we ended up paying for some things like costs and whatever, but we really got people to donate because remember, they also got to be part of this exciting moment and they got to put their, they had a booth with their signage. And so, mm -hmm. but I think that he believed that people, he could make anything happen. And I then believed that anything could happen. And maybe I always had that mindset. And I don't know where that comes from. And that's interesting because I moved to San Francisco with nothing, no money. I had a, I packed up my geoprism and drove cross country in three days and I had nothing. <laughs> and I lived with a friend and had six jobs. So I think I have that mentality too, that anything could happen. And how did you link up with Kelly, Kelly Dwayne? And how did this idea of doing a documentary come about? Okay. So that's my next chapter is that, so with politics happen, all the stuff, I, I thought this is no longer, I was exhausted. I was burnt out. And I thought, I really want to do something that I can, like, I felt like I was sort of a, essentially a producer. I was essentially like a um, making stuff happen for all these people. So I had those skills, 
But I also, at the time, I became obsessed with documentaries. And I was watching every documentary. I loved The War Room about Bill Clinton's candidacy. And Mm -hmm. there were so many great documentaries. I mean, I saw all of them, all the documentaries from, like, the big documentaries from the 70s, 80s, 90s. There was a few about politics that I was just really taken by. And I thought I was driving. Oh, so back up. After the election, Willie Brown, I said, I need a break. I haven't had a day off in four years. And I bought a one-way ticket. I went backpacking for nine months through Southeast Asia. And I did my first meditation retreat, my first silent 10-day retreat in Thailand. Because I knew, you know, I was suffering too. Like my dad had died and I decided to, instead of, like I was in therapy, but I wasn't really working on myself. I just got busy. Like he died. I went back up to college three weeks later. I got six jobs, three jobs. I took three classes, got two jobs. And I was just working. I, I decided to numb the pain by filling it with work and drive and not slowing down. And I was exhausted. So I went on this trip to kind of find myself. It's like eat, pray, love. I did all those things. And then I came back and I was like, I really want to create something that is meaningful that I can create that could like, I could, I remember saying this at the time I didn't have better words for it was like something that I can like point to and be like, I create, this is something that I've made. Like, it's not just helping other people with their missions. I didn't know what it was, but I, then I came up with the idea for a a documentary because Willie Brown. So this is kind of, I haven't told this in a while, so it's hard to, to, so I came back from Asia and he's like, Hey, cause I had a very good relationship with him. He's like, you're back. I'm going to China. Will you lead a trade mission to China for me? We're going to China. Hong Kong and Singapore. And I was like, sure. So then I'm like the expert on China. So then it was ironic. I went back and then for two years, I had a job being an international consultant. I started a business essentially where like the speak to Antonio Vigoroso when he was speaker of the state legislator before he became mayor of San Francisco and said, well, will you do one to Mexico? So for two years, I traveled around the world with politicians on trade missions making these events like we'd go meet with like the minister like we went to um buenos aires and met with the head of of uh of um transportation in curitiba when i went with antonio like we just went everywhere so willie brown i made this trip happen and i traveled and i like i got them to keep the wall great wall of china open because we weren't going to be there in time for something like that's the kind of shit i did i'm like it has to happen it's willie brown so anyway, I did that for two years. And then I thought, I still need to create something that's my own. I was driving over the Golden Gate Bridge one day, and I had this vision of a film about Willie Brown because he is a fascinating man. He's brilliant. I mean, I saw him work in meetings. Like, I'd sit with, like, I was also his issues director for a while, and I'd sit with him in meetings with, like, policy where all these people would be sitting around, and he just wouldn't say a word for two hours, and he'd come up with the most brilliant way to solve a problem. And anyway, so I loved him, and I thought... Or I liked his work, but I knew he's controversial. And I said, I'm going to do a film about him running for re-election. I didn't know what it was going to be. So I took a class at a film place in San Francisco called the Film Arts Foundation. And in that class, I was like, I'm already doing this film. It's his, he's, launched, he's launching his re-election campaign. And so I don't know what to, what is it called when you, I need someone to shoot it. What's that person called? And they're like a director of photography or I'm like, okay, great. I need that. And I need whatever. So Kelly Duane was in my class with me and she's like, I'll help you make the film. And so literally my whole class, my teacher ended up shooting and Kelly was being my producer and that's how it happened. And I went on this wild ride of making it and I raised all the money for it because I knew how to raise money and I knew all the big donors in San Francisco And it took me a long time. It took me about two or three years. And it was my baby. It was my first baby before Sex with Emily. I was like, I'm in it. I shot 160 hours of footage. And I whittled it down to an hour. And I made a documentary and took it to festivals. And I was on PBS. And it was a a great film. I didn't know what the hell I was doing, which is also a theme in my life we'll come back to. I never know what the hell I'm doing. (laughs) So did you you imagine that you would continue doing, becoming a... a I shooting did. documentaries? Yeah, because I did a film and I loved it, but it was so hard. And this is classic. I was so burnt out that by the time it came out, I was like, I'm so tired. It was so... Because at every stage, I had to learn how to shoot. I had to learn how to edit. I had to... I mean, I had an editor, but I had to learn how to market it and promote it and cut a trailer and apply to film festivals. I applied to 160 film festivals. I had to take the VHS tape to the post office. And like, I, I still have the letter. I have 100 rejection letters. You know, I got like into three festivals, but I got into good ones, but whatever. It was a whole thing. But I was exhausted. And I was like, okay, you know what I like? This leads me to current day. I loved interviewing people. 
which is funny because now it's like harder for me to interview, like I, whatever. But I love telling people stories and I love the interview process. So I was going to do a, so I thought maybe I'll just do, um, yeah, and I was going to do another documentary, but I thought, what could I do? And I started a cable access show, a very short lived one, because anybody can have a cable access show in any city, just so you know, you just have to take a weekend course. So I was going to say, I've always been like, sex and relationships was like, the wild card in my life. I always dated, but I didn't really want to commit. And I've never thought of myself as a monogamous person. And I thought, what is the deal with sex and relationships and why they seem so complicated and half of them end in divorce. And by the way, the sex I'm having is okay, not great. I'm also an overachiever, but everyone was like, my sex was amazing last night. I was like, what does that mean? So I was always asking people, when you say you had amazing sex, back up. Like, what did that mean? Like, we was his penis double jointed? Were you swinging from the rafters? Were you like, what? Were you having 16 orgasms? And I always wanted to know. So I thought I'm going to do a show about sex in San Francisco. So I had an intern for my film and we started doing the show. And then she said to me, you should do, she goes, you know what? Maybe you should try a podcast. I'm like, what the hell's a podcast? This is 2005. She goes, well, it's only audio and you just need to record files and you don't need video. I'm like, thank God, because video is a harder. And I'm like, let's do that. So that's where the Sex with Emily started. And I invited a bunch of friends over to my house from di in different stages of relationships and dating and love and gender orientations and sexualities. And I interviewed them all day. So like, this is where the change happened. I sat there for like five hours. I hired a sound guy off Craigslist and I just sort of talked. And I realized that the dial the conversation that was coming out was about people being really open and real and authentic about they didn't really understand their bodies and their sexuality. They were sort of on a journey and everyone was on a different path. But but the, the common theme, everyone was like, they didn't really know what good great sex was. They didn't really know about relationships and the way that I needed to hear that I, I we were all trying to figure it out. And I thought, there's really nowhere else to go for this information. And I sat there, it was almost like akin to what people say when they love at first sight or they fall in love or it's they knew the moment I saw it. I knew this was my path. In that moment and that day, I thought, this is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. Because remember, I'd been on this path, like pivoting when it didn't work. I was like, that was work, that didn't work. And I'm like, this is it. This is a dialogue and this is a conversation that's going to change people's lives because no one's talking about it. And I was so, like, I remember I want to be in, I was like, this, there's so much to learn, there's so much to unpack. And I just read every sex book on the planet and I started going deep into podcasting. And, and every week I released podcasts and I interviewed people. And that's where that all started. Okay. So I have a few follow up questions. <laughs> I don't even know how it, this, you can edit this stuff. It's a lot of it. Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's fine. We're going to edit. So uh, you invited these, these friends of yours to come to your apartment, you had a camcorder. Yep. You're gonna put them on camera. This is before funny. Instagram. It was, it was this, I still have it. It was this audio, oh no, this was my traveling audio player. It was a, it was a soundboard. Right, but they were gonna talk about their sex life and their ideas about sex on record for yeah. you to then do whatever you want to do with that. Yeah. And they were fine with, they were fine with that. Really fine with it. Because remember, and what I find out is that people are like, how are you going to get anyone to talk about sex? Everybody wants to talk about sex. Not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily on, 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 on a podcast, but right. everybody has questions. Everybody is lost. Nobody had marching or no one understood it. It was like, and how do you stay with someone for a year? How do you stay with someone long-term and have great sex? How do you know what you want? No one was talking about women's masturbation or women's orgasm at all. And so people were open. They were like, yeah, I will tell you my opinions and my beliefs. Now, not everybody got into like the nitty gritty details, but people were like, here's my beliefs on it. Or here's why I got divorced. Or here's what I like in the bedroom. But it wasn't as specific as it's gotten over the years, but people were open. And I actually did film the first 20. And I have that tape, those tapes, but they... I never used them because I couldn't get, didn't have people, I couldn't afford, like, I didn't know what to do with video at the time. Right. So I, now, we were open. How did you come across Captain Erotica? Oh my God. I met Captain Erotica because I was really into Burning Man. Um, or I was into Burning Man yet. Burning Man is a festival and in the desert that everyone goes to and dresses. Do you know the Burning Man festival? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, so my friend Mark would go to Burning Man 
And that was before I went. And he's like, you have to meet Captain Erotica because he's told. So remember, once you get into this realm of sex and relationships, and dating, everybody comes out of the war work. And also remember, it's San Francisco where people are very open and people like mm. poison someone naked or walking down the street, someone flogging someone. Like you're just like, okay, yeah, they're they're trans or whatever. Like, welcome to San Francisco. People are doing their thing. So he said to me, Captain Erotica was at my Burning Man camp last year. And he is somebody who works with people in open relationships and he helps men who are um, with their wives. Like he teaches them how to be better lovers to their wives and he teaches them how to uh, whatever. He's open. He's like spanks and I don't know. I was like, okay. So I met him because people thought he'd be a great interview. So he was one of my first interviews because he was the person I knew that was in the sex space doing being, I thought that was so shocking like at the time. It was like, it, it took me pretty quickly to catch up that like open relationships and people don't have to live in a monogamous life and that's okay too. And that it actually does work. And it's not just people who are horny or people who are sex addicts. Some people are, but some people just like know that monogamy isn't for them and they know how to practice excellent communication and rigorous honesty. And so all that. So he was my first person that I was like, wow, people do this. And Men let you have sex with their wives in front of them and to show them how to have sex with them in a way that's completely ethical. Now, who knows? Like, maybe he went off the grid and something crazy happened. But at the time, it was, like, really groundbreaking for me. Mm. And also, because you had been, you you already shot a documentary and with hundreds of hours of footage, you knew how to interview people. You knew, you knew how to bring out what was most compelling about their story. Yeah. And, uh, and so when you uploaded that and it got however many, 75,000 downloads or what what have you. Were you surprised when that it got such a big reaction? Yeah. Well, here's the thing. And I think I said 75,000 in the New York. I don't remember how many, but it was, a, it was, remember there was like, it was 2005. It was the first month of podcasting or the first mm-hmm. three months. And I remember just uploading the file and being like, holy, I hope this is good, like obsessing, not worried. But then people started emailing me and saying, we like your show and it's it's really helping us. And 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 so I was really, I was like, wow, this is, I'm getting reinforcement. People want to hear this. I'm not alone. Because remember also, I was trying to find my own answers. I wasn't a doctor of human sexuality. I hadn't studied. I was just curious, really curious and wanted to help myself and others. So I was... I think that I realized that so many people were in the same boat. And so that felt really good that people were like, it helped me and thank you and had questions. So yeah, it felt incredible, but I'm, it's so funny. Like I wish, and this is something I'm still working on right now is like, how do we take that in and appreciate it in the moment rather than on to the next? Oh, that's great, but I have no money. Oh, that's great. But how am I going to keep getting it out? Oh, I don't like all the worries that come up. I, I wish I could have been like, wow, congratulations, Emily. That's awesome. People are really into your show. That's, that just feels good. I should go out and celebrate, but I think, and I still do this. So thank you for this moment. How do we, how do we um, work on receiving? Mm. I try to work on that a lot. How do I like, were you, were you still meditating at that time since you did your 10 day retreat in Thailand? no, I, I, I wanted to be meditating all the time, but I, I was never able to make it a, even though then I would go back and do another 10 day. Cause I thought that would help. But then I realized it's about integration and consistency and not just, no, I wasn't, I wasn't. Not so what was your, what was your spiritual or, or what, if, what your release first? Because you, you mentioned that you would burn yourself out from time to time. What was your way of releasing or managing stress? Um, my way was exercise. I know, and, and you mat, you learned masturbation at 25. So maybe that was a part of it too. I don't know. Yes, I masturbated a lot. For me, my release has always been athletic and working mm-hmm. out. And I used to run marathons and that was a, that I thought that was a release for me and like rock climb and I would do yoga. I started doing yoga in like the late nineties. So yoga to me was a little bit more um, of that, like that felt a little bit meditation adjacent. Um, right. But my release was mostly like my friends and I would say it was exercise. It was, it was moving my body in whatever way. And what was your financial situation like in 2005? Did you have money saved up when you started this new podcast? Oh, I I had some money saved up. 
So I did something really silly. I did not know what I was doing. I had some money, not a lot. I had a job at the time. I was working for this production company in San Francisco, selling product, like trying to sell shows and come up with shows. It was kind of like something I wasn't that into, but they were paying me a couple thousand dollars a month. But early on in the podcast, I had a lot of success in air quotes, meaning within the first three months, I got offered a live show on the radio for this station in San Francisco, CBS radio, which was big. They were like, we love your podcast. Can you come do it on Saturday nights, 11 to 12? And then it's expanded to 11 to two. And then I got a TV company. This was like, this was like 2007. So 2005, I was still working on another job. And then I, 2006, I started doing well. I got this radio show and then they, then I got like a book offer and then I got a TV, a potential TV thing and things were happening. Like I was, I was like, oh, well, I'm going to quit this job because it's, it's all happening. And then I took out a loan, like a business loan. And, um, and I, cause I had such, I was very naive. Like I just thought. I didn't live in LA. You remember this. I, I knew no one entertainment. I was living in San Francisco. No one was doing what I was doing. And I thought that if my lawyer called me and said, they want to syndicate your radio show for five days a week and it's an 800,000. I remember him saying this to me. Like, it's a, it'll, that's an $800,000 deal. I was like, oh my God. Like, I was like, it's all happening. So I took out a loan to get me by because I had no money. And then the recession hit in 2009. You took out a $60,000 loan just before the recession hit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I, I, I had no money. So I ended up completely not having any money. And like my mom let me money and, you know. You moved in with a friend? I moved in. Okay. I was just thinking about this. So I, so I, I lived in this apartment in San Francisco and I sold, I sold, I still, I sold everything I had on credit. I didn't have a lot. I sold like my juicer. It was like two, it was the things I had that were expensive. My juicer, my curtains, my suitcase, like whatever I could sell, I sold. So I sold it all and I moved in with my friend and I slept on her couch for about nine months or she had an extra bedroom. It's not really a couch. It was, it's, um, and, um, and I rented out my place. It was very humbling. And it was like probably one of the best things that happened though, to be honest. Like I, I drove my friends to the airport for 40 bucks because there was no Uber. And I was like, if you're going, like, let me drive. I was very like, what can I do? Because I was, I had this, I knew, I knew that sex with Emily, that, that there's no way it can't be successful. I have people listening. It's helping people and there's interest. So I'm not going to walk away from it. I'm just going to do what I need to do to get by. I got a job. And remember, I'm like older though. I, I was answering. Yeah, you're in your mid thirties. You're in your mid thirties. Your brother has this skyrocketing legal career, you yeah. know, I your other friends are probably like making well in the six um, figures. It's everything. Yeah. And it was hard. My mom flew out from San Francisco and she was like, try to do an intervention. Cause she walked in my apartment. <laughs> me, I had these papers up. It was like that scene from a beautiful mind with all my, I'm like, well, mom, this yeah. is the business plan. It's all going to work. And she was like, you know, you could get a job at Nordstrom's, like, cause you're really great. Hey, and, and Starbucks has a health plan, and I'm like, I'm not. And she thought I was insane, and I was a little bit insane. But I had you have to be insane. You yeah. have to be out of your mind. Out of my mind. I'm like, I believe in this mission. It's going to happen. It, there's too much. Success. There's too much interest. Whatever. So I didn't walk away from it. Everyone's successful, you know. Yeah. Like my mom's like, I'm not. My mom paid for my health care. She's like, I'm not helping you out though. Like, which again even though she has money and like my brother tossed me some, a little bit of money. Like he's like, I'll help you, but I'm not helping you too much. Like this is enough he paid to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. But, and I, I appreciate cause well, my mother and my father, my brother and my brother are successful. They could have bankrolled it. They could have been like fine, but they were like, no. And that's when I moved in with a friend and I didn't ask them for anything else. Cause I was like, I'm going to make this work. So, Oh my God. I would know. And then I got a job and this was actually really good for me. And I got to say, this is inspirational. Everybody. I was, I'll just say it. I was 40 and I was working for a woman since I went back to my political roots who was running for mayor and she needed some help in her office. And this is actually really humbling. I don't think I've ever talked about this, but I went in there and I was essentially answering phones 
and assisting her when she needed help. And it was, the good thing about it is that it was consistency and I went in five days a week, ten, like nine to five, and I sat there and I like did office stuff. And I was making, I remember, I remember getting the paycheck. It was like, maybe it was like 400 a week or 500 a week, but after a month I had $2,000 and then I had 3000 You know, it was like I started building a bank account again from the way of like me being responsible. And I actually liked having this job because it wasn't stressful. It was a little humbling, but I had my, my, I wasn't obsessed and churning on sex with Emily and what I could do. So in that period, I was still doing sex with Emily after work. I'd go and record it with at the studio with my friend who had worked at CBS still, like Menace, who was on my show and he helped me. But I, I, it wasn't my all consuming. I had another responsibility. I got, I took the attention off of it. I wasn't trying so hard. And in that year period where I had this other job and I was trying, I moved back into my place. I, other things started to happen. So what happened then? I got, oh, I, I started, this is when I started to get products. And uh, this is, this is okay, you mentioned a, you mentioned a sex toy that you had liked on your yeah, podcast. Yeah, you really have done your research. So I, <laughs> I got some sex toys sent to me from this company called Jeju. Mm-hmm. And they make this toy called the Mimi, which honestly is still one of my favorite toys. And I, t- I was like, couldn't believe I got a free sex toy. And then I, or they, I got a box of them, but I liked this one the best. And I talked about it on my show and they called and said, our sales went up by 40%. Mm-hmm. For me talking about it on my podcast in like 2010 or 11. And then, or 10. And I was like, wow, okay, well, let's do something. Pay me and I'll give you a YouTube video. I'll give you a tweet because I had Twitter and YouTube and I had, there was no Instagram at the time. And then I just started, then I got, then I got started being business. I started talking to brands. I went to sex conventions and then I just started hustling for sponsorships and figuring out how to make a living doing this podcast. And then, then, then I became. And just before that you were in $130,000 of debt and you were doing all these little odd jobs and cleaning and working at this lady's office. Yeah, I cleaned houses. But, and you and you never missed a week of your podcast. Never missed a week of the podcast. I cleaned houses. I did because you're. I cleaned houses. I sold stuff. I, yeah, I did everything to, to do the podcast. Never missed it. Never missed it. How did this book come about in 2011, the one you did with the other people? So the book that came out in 2011 was, so... It was a company called Weldon Owen in San Francisco, and they approached me and they said, "We want you to write a book called Hot, like Hot Sex." They already had the concept for the book, and they said, "We want you to be like a kind of like a work for hire." And I, I and I did it. And then they said, "We're going to ma- match you up with Jamie Waxman, who's also a sex. She's like a sex ed- sex therapist at the time, sex educator." And so we wrote it. I was in San Francisco, and she was in LA, and we wrote this book. And it was all positions. It was these beautiful, they took photographs of people having sex in different positions and then they illustrated it. It's a really beautiful book. And so that's how it happened. And so we worked on it. We had editors there, but it wasn't really like my book. It didn't feel like it was my story. It was more like tips, but it's a beautiful book. I think it's, they won't, it's out of print right now, which is a bummer. But anyway, um, yeah, that's how it came about. And that was exciting. And then I got a reality show. But first I had a reality show that didn't get picked up before the recession in 2007. So like I'm telling you, like all the things were happening that didn't happen. But then mm-hmm. I got a reality show. Um, and then that sort of things just started to look up. Things started to come up again from that. And I, and I, because I got smart about business, I was very like just spending money and not understanding the, the, the consequences of what I was doing. I didn't really understand that part of it. Like I didn't really have mm-hmm. anyone to, yeah. Were there other sex podcasts that were starting to come out? And, you know, did you feel like there was any there was competition in this, in this marketplace? Or were you just kind of so far ahead in terms of your own the traction that you were getting that it didn't even matter? I got to be point? honest with you, Light, and I don't know if this is a good thing or I don't know. If, I always think everything comes back. Everything has a shadow side. But I don't, I'm not someone who looks behind me and I'm not competitive. So I wasn't, mm. I was so caught up in what I was doing that I wasn't really looking at who else was doing stuff or who's coming up behind me. And, and, and I, I know that Dan Savage is at a podcast almost as long as I have, I think. Mm-hmm. And he's great. Like I, I, like the thing is, and this is the thing about sex and this is what pissed me off early on. I did talk to someone who's giving me advice and he's like, sex with Emily. He's like, 
how do you know that tomorrow, this was like, a, this was early on. This was the first person I texted, like, there could be sex with, sex with Shannon or sex with Jane. I'm like, yeah, there might be sex with Shannon or sex with Jane, but they won't be sex with Emily because I'm doing it in a way that's unique to me. Like there's other meditation teachers, there's other podcasts, like, but you have your own voice. So I was never felt like, well, they can't be me. They're not going to be who I am. People don't just decide. I mean, maybe, and maybe they do. Like, honestly, I well, and now I'm like, amazing. Like, people might just like Dan's way of talking about it or other people's. That's great because at the end of the day, I just want people to feel safe talking about sex. And I want people to feel good in their bodies. And I want people to do it without shame. And if someone else's message is going to resonate with them, that's great. There's more than enough to go around. So I didn't spend a But yeah, I do think it was the probably the one of the only, but I think there was like a swinging podcast. Like I don't really, yeah, I didn't really know all of them. I, I didn't, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. I, I can't answer that, but it was such a space that we're all trying to survive. No one was making any money either. So if we're talking early on, like we're all trying to make it work, but I didn't really know. How did it, how did it affect your personal life being known as the sexologist in your thirties? You were obviously like dating around and, yeah. and how, how did that, show up in your, yeah, in your it still does I mean early on I was like I'm talking about I'm like it's not you know I'm not a um I'm just like a nice Jewish girl from Michigan like I I'm just I'm not like some crazy sex whatever I I'm just <laughs> I'm a person and I I remember saying that I'm like I I I remember one time someone said to me well you can just tell me you have some hands-on experience but you're not an, you know you're not and so I but so Again, it's been 16 years, so I've gone through a whole growth spurt. I would say a whole period of life. Early on, I was like, whatever, like this is what I do. But then now I think it's, it didn't impact it because also I'm a very good read of people. If someone's just with me, let's say, because like, oh, she's the sex expert. Let me have sex with her. They wouldn't even get to my door. Like I, I wouldn't even, wouldn't even know. They wouldn't get that far because I read, I understand people. I think I'm really have a good head. I can kind of understand people's intentions. So I didn't like get into trouble or anything really horrible happen. Um, I think it impacted because sure, like some guys might be intimidated. People always say, are guys intimidated to date you? I get asked that question often and you're asking it in a much better way, uh, a much more, not that you're asking that, but, but yeah, I think that it was a thing, but it didn't impact it in a way that felt limiting. I know with me, like when people, you know, they hear, oh, you're a meditation expert. You've been doing it for 15 years. It's like the last thing I ever want to talk about is meditation when I'm hanging out with people. Right? <laughs> That's what people always want to bring up, like right. as if I would be really interested in talking about that. Is that, is that the yes. same with you and sex? Yes, they do. Everyone wants to talk about it. I mean, I guess when I go out with guys now on dates or wherever, they're like, oh, tell me about your career. But they don't often like, for me, it'd have to be like, tell me about anal. Like we don't go there, <laughs> but yeah, they want to talk about it or they research or they listen to the show. And, but now I'm in a different place. Yeah. I don't want to talk about that on a date. Like I'm much more interested in their stories, but I think it's more of the challenges that people are like, this is in our culture. Like guys are supposed to be the most, um, educated in their f guys are supposed to be the leaders of sex. They're supposed to be the ones who initiate they have to know everything. They're supposed to know everything. So then to be with a woman who's supposed to be an expert could be intimidating. So, but I don't think I'm in that place right now. I think I meet good people. Mm. But yeah. Why do you think as a society, we bury our heads when it comes to sex and talking about sex and being honest, even with each other, with our friends about sex? Because, you know, with guy friends, you're never going to have a guy. It's very rare to have a guy friend tell his other guy friend hey yeah you know um i'm horrible at sex or i'm just not that great or i don't understand women like everyone tries to pretend like they are this adonis right and, and that's not really what's happening yeah, that's what i'm that's i'm glad you said this because that's exactly what i'm trying to change is because we don't have any role models we have no we have no examples of people talking about sex in a healthy way mm -hmm. we have a lot of shame around it because we often if sex does come up in conversation, it's usually something negative, something like, oh, we had sex. We didn't have sex. And when you're a kid, maybe it was don't have sex. Mm -hmm. So now we just don't have a framework for it. And yeah, men are often like, oh, I'm supposed to be the Adonis of sex. But there's not the, the nuance of it. No one's like talking about 
to how did you feel and about pleasure and what really went on. And there isn't, that's why I think it's shame. I think that when topic of sex does come up and people try to talk about it in a relationship, since they've never heard, think about this, you're going through life. Maybe you had a seventh grade class where you talked about sex for five minutes or you just talked to your friends. Like, oh, we had sex. We didn't have sex. Did you give him a blowjob? Did it? But then someone says to you, I'd like to talk about our sex life. The first thing we think is like, I've done something wrong. They're going to dump me. I'm inadequate. All of our greatest fears, which is that we are not lovable and we're not good enough, comes up when it comes around sex because we don't. So I, so I guess what I'm trying to do is try to, in my work here, is trying to get sex to be something that we do talk about and that we do put under the, the umbrella of health and wellness, that it is part of our, if we're meditating and we are exercising, we're eating healthy and are nutritious and we are spiritual and we are good friends and family members, we also have to bring sex and welcome it with open arms into this space of health and wellness because it's not just the old in and out and porn and evil, but with like religion, I think that still lives in that space. But I just want sex. I mean, sex is an act of self-care too. If it's done, you know, masturbation and it's an act of self-care and it's an act of, of love to yourself and others. And it's just, there's just so much stigma and so much shame. And we literally don't even have the words to talk about it. We don't even, yeah, that's why religion, Mm -hmm. shame, trauma, like, acceptance and fear of not being loved or judged. So you now have the longest running sex and relationship podcast out of all the podcasts. And um, you now have a master class, which is really impressive. Congratulations on that. Um, Thank you. Where do you think we're, as a society, where do you think we're going to be, say, 25 or 50 years from now and really how, how will our conversation around sex change if you have anything to do with it? If I have anything to do with it, we're going to be talking about sex. Like we're talking about the weather. I said, this is my master class, but I'm like, it's overclassed with a chance of orgasms. It's cloudy. You know, <laughs> like it is something that we start talking to our kids about at a, as, as a very young age like in the Netherlands, in Finland, there's some places where they talk. They, it's the only place in the world that I want to model sex education after that, where kids are a young age, they're babies. They're like, here's your, like they're doing the body, here's your toes, and here's your knees, and, 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 and here's your vulva or your penis. But what we do now is we go, here's your toes, here's your knees, here's your stomach. We jump over, we don't name the parts. So if you bring this into kids as babies and you say, here's your body parts, here's their names, there is no shame in them. And, you know, and then when kids start to touch themselves, you don't tell them, don't touch yourself. You say, that's something that, yes, that feels good, doesn't it? Well, that's something that only you can do. And you teach them about consent at a young age. And then it becomes part of your culture and society that it is not something that's going to be shamed. So I would like comprehensive sex education that is accurate. And we don't have accurate sex education that is inclusive and accurate right now. In seven, only in 17 states in America is are they required to have sex that be sexually accurate, to be medically mm-hmm. accurate. And so I want it to be something where we are looking at sex as, as an act of, of, of pleasure and that we're for, especially for women or vulva owners, as I say, that they understand that they understand their body. I mean, we're walking around with these bodies that we just do not understand. And even men, men have penis challenges. They don't want to go to their doctor. They don't want to talk to their friends about their sex life. They don't want to have their doctors about their penises. Not all men, but many of us. It's just like, it's too shameful, but it's our friggin' bodies. It is in our bodies. And so many women walk around and men, I'm going to tell you from women, like, I don't want to look at it. I don't want to take a mirror. It's shameful. It's all these things. But like, you are giving life out of your body. You're getting life and pleasure, and it's a part of you, and it's beautiful just the way it is. And when you get into loving it as a part of you, it's not separate from you, and you start to embrace your entire body and all of your sexuality for all of that it is in a holistic way that just, I mean, that it's just, we don't talk about anymore. Kind of like 
kind of like meditation or therapy. People would never talk about going to therapy in the like 90s. They wouldn't say my therapist. And now people are like, I'm going to the drag queen. I'm going to my therapist. Like I want people to talk about their sex life that way, that it becomes part of the lexicon that, you know, and granted, not, it's privacy too. Not everyone needs to know the specific details of what you did last night. I'm not saying that. You don't have to publish like a blog about it. But the people that matter in your life, whether it's your doctors or your lovers or your family that need to know about your sexual desires or your sexual challenges, you could be able to talk to them. Your partner needs to understand what you want in the bedroom, your pleasures, your desires. And I just want it to be open and I want to give people the language to do so so they feel empowered. That's what I want. That's the world I see. Are there any statistics around the percentage of relationship or marriage failures that have to do with sex? Or do you think sex is so pervasive that it's pretty much in every... I'd say it's in every... The root of every problem that's happening. It's the root of most problems. They often say when sex is a problem in a relationship, you don't... You, you Maybe it's like takes up 3% of their concerns, but when it is a when it is a problem, it's like the 90% of everything <laughs> that having sex, it takes over. And so I think that there's three things, three main causes for divorce, and it's sex, it's um, children, and money. That's what they say. So that's what they say. Studies have set, showed that. And so I think that in many of the relationships, if they have not built a sexual relationship that can go, that they haven't prioritized pleasure, they haven't talked about their sex life, they don't both, if they don't both have a growth mindset around sex, they don't, they don't decide before they get married that sex is something that's actually important and we, we recognize that we're going to grow and change and let's decide that we're going to prioritize it. Most couples don't do that because it's always great at the beginning and they get married and like, what the hell are we doing? So I think for Matt, I would say maybe a half of divorces or maybe more than that have to do with sex, but I don't have any set numbers, but I know that the majority of couples are going to have a challenge with it over time because it changes. We look at it like, it's like our diet. Like, do you eat the same way you did in your twenties and in your forties? Do you exercise the same way? Even pray to the same God. Like maybe you've evolved around the same religion. Like your meditation practice has probably evolved. But the problem with sex is I always say we get stuck. If we were having sex in our twenties and when we were in high school, it's still going to happen because we've never enriched. We've never widened our circle, widened our lens around sex. It's like, since it's shrouded in mystery and shame, we might still be having sex the same way. We think, well, I like that in my 20s. So what I'm saying is it's an ever-evolving palette. It's an ever-evolving landscape. And there's so much to learn that I just op- I, I welcome and I encourage people to look at sex as something that you get you get to embrace and, and decide what works for you and do your own research and with your body practice having healthy communication. So it can be very expansive if we choose to allow ourselves to step into it in that way. So I have one question. This is just a case study for those listening who maybe, as I know you've talked about, this is one of the most common issues. And uh, and maybe the answer is not as simple as I'm going to be posing the question, but I want to just explore this a little bit. So you have two partners. Partner A has a libido where they are perfectly fine having sex once a week. Partner B would prefer to have sex five times a week. What do you do in that situation? Well, that's something that we call in the business uh, desire <laughs> discrepancy. Or mis- what is it called? Desire discrepancy mm-hmm. or mismatched libidos. And it's the most common question I get asked. Do you want to know why? Tell me. People with high desire typically don't match up with other people with high desire. So in every relationship, there's a high desire partner and there's a low desire partner. Mm-hmm. And I don't like to speak in absolutes, but it, absolutes, but it's pretty common that, 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 that they're not going to match up for whatever reason. And they don't usually find this out until after they're married but mm-hmm. or together. But it's also okay. So you can't really count what happens in the honeymoon period, right? That's no, just the honeymoon period. Don't make any decisions in that period. <laughs> Did they say don't make decisions when you're anxious or you're stressed? Like, don't make decisions about your future when you're in the honeymoon phase. Just don't. But we can't help it because it's it's, it's temporary, just like everything. But your the honeymoon phase is certainly temporary. So what happens is that's why I say that one of the questions you should ask is, do they want to have kids? How do they want if they where do they want to live? How are they going to rate what religion? And also, what do you have a growth mindset around sex? That's what I think the question you need to ask before you commit. So in these situations, though, you can totally work around it because. 
The high desire, the low desire partner has the control in the relationship because they're the ones who are deciding. They're essentially the gatekeepers to your sex life and they're deciding it's a yes, it's a no, it's a go. Mm. So what these heal to do, and I'm not saying these relationships are doomed. What I'm saying is you get to work or you get to say, okay, let's figure out. So now we know that the right number is like 2.3 times a week, right? If you split the week or 3.2 times a week. But also what I find in a lot of these situations is not that they, we, and this is the other thing we didn't even touch on, that I love to expand the definition of sex. People think it's just penetration. Sex can mean so many things. It could be intimacy. It could be giving each other massages. It could be taking a bath. Maybe your part, the partner who wants it five days a week really just wants a really long hug. He really just wants, she really wants presence. She wants to spend a day together on the couch, you know, together in an intimate way. Maybe it's mutual masturbation where you're lying side by side and you're both getting, like there's ways to fill this five times a week with compromise, but also things that might not be what they actually need, like penetration every day. Actually, that can get boring after a while too. If we could, if we could decentralize or we could not center so much on penetration as sex, but we could start to expand our view of sex as meaning it's intimacy and connection. Mm. That can mean so many other things. Then I believe that these couples could really find a way to come together and find a, like a sex plan that actually works for their relationship. I'm, I'm a fan of scheduling sex or scheduling an intimate time because with busy couples and busy lives, it just won't happen. So if you know that this is our time or our day, it's going to happen and then what are we going to do? Like, that's why I have this great tool on my site, the Yes, No, Maybe list. It's like a free downloadable guide where, because couples sometimes don't know what to do to keep it interesting because if the honeymoon phase is going to end, they're like, what do we do now? So it has a bunch of suggestions that couples, a little quiz people can take and figure out what they're actually into sexually. I have a pleasure planner on our website that couples can download and kind of plan out their intimate time, pleasure time for the next year. So I try to give people resources because it's since we've there's like a dearth of knowledge around it and you have to seek it out, which is why I'm grateful. Thank you for having me on your podcast because people don't often think about this in this way or don't know where to go for this information because a lot of stuff is not true or not realistic online. So anyway. Well, your masterclass is also very thorough. So if people have access to masterclass or if they want to get access to it, yours is a great place to start because I think, like you said, this issue, this opportunity is something that, all of us, all adults experience. And, um, and it's good just to have a primer or Rosetta stone for, uh, what some of these things mean in, in, in relationship, in the relationship context. So is was there anything when you shot your masterclass, was there anything that surprised you about that process? Cause I know a lot of other professionals look at that and they go, oh, I would love to do a masterclass. What was that experience like for you? It was, it was really, um, it was, it wasn't, it was a really big response. I took it very, like it was a really big res responsibility. I was like, I want this to be, I felt like a huge responsibility to really deliver. And like, I, yes, I could do it, but there's no script and they're very open. They're like, do what you want. Like we want it to be your court. We picked you because it's your course. Mm. And so I spent a lot of time. I actually, I actually, for the first time, like I took, I did, replayed a bunch of, you know, repeat like old podcasts. And I was like, I'm going to just put my head down. And I ended up writing like hundred pages of just what, of shaping what it would be. And so the process, what was interesting is it really helped me ground in my work. It was like my own mini dissertation and it helped me really realize what's important and what I'd want to teach. And it got me sort of also reinvigorated with my work again, like, oh, wow, I really love my work. And how can I pivot it after this too? Because there's a lot of stuff that I want to do differently as well. So anyway, it was, it was an incredible experience. It was, it was, I put a lot of pressure on myself. So it was stressful. I was nervous, like, well, you know, the imposter syndrome, like what if I'm not, you know, all that shit comes up, but ultimately I'm really, I'm really, really proud of it. Mm. it but it was a lot. I, I take it. It wasn't just like, Oh yeah. Like I'm like, does everyone do this? Like, I'm like, does Martin Scorsese, like does he prep or do you just walk in and you pepper him questions about filmmaking? It's like, everyone's different. I'm like, okay, because I, I'm taking this seriously. I need to know, you know, so. Yeah, yeah that was great. And, and also just through your, you've done thousands of episodes. No stone has been left unturned in terms of sex. 
you just go back and look at your podcast archive as well. I'm curious, how are you defining success these days? Much differently, I think. I mean, honestly, I I define sex as I'm looking way more internally. I'm looking at like my 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 mental health and my wealth mm. and the richness in my life around me. Like that is the most important thing. Is am I taking care of myself? Do I am I am I so I my meditation practice is thriving. Just so you know, I'm my my own. Like I'm <laughs> I meditate. I I work out. I help. I have good people around me that I like. I'm spending time with only the people that I love that it, that we fill each other's up like a mutually beneficial relationships. I think I'm successful. I mean, for me, I'm defining it as I hate to say the word balance because I don't even think that is real mm-hmm. in some ways. <laughs> but it's just I'm, I'm for the first time I'm saying no more, and I'm really trying to because I've never been a planner, so I'm really trying to look at my year now and say like after the you know where are the pockets of time because otherwise I'll just keep going then I'm going to take see my family because that's important to me I have three nieces I'm very close with like I'm obsessed with my we love each other and I want to be there for them and my family you know my parents and I'm looking at my year like okay where am I going to travel where am I going to have love like I'm prioritizing relationships like to me that would be successful like I'm actually for the first time in my life in a place where I'm like I'm going to make time for it the great irony this is not that I haven't been in great relationships but now I'm like you know I want that relationship that is someone that I can you know be with in the way that feels good so success is success for me is feeling spiritually mentally physically emotionally well Mm. And better at that, but I mean that that, that makes everything better because I've right. had it. yeah. With business though, it's successful as having a really good team of people who, um, like it's really hard. for me. My biggest challenge is like managing and doing what I'm doing. So I just want everyone on my like success would be like they're happy and know what they're doing and in good places. And, right. Anyway, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say in relationships, like I used to define. I think like most people, you define success by longevity, but now it's it's, it's yeah. completely changed. I define success in relationships as just being able to be myself. Like yeah. the more I could be myself, even if the relationship only lasts a week, then that was a that was a great <laughs> that was a great relationship. Exactly. If I feel like I'm uh, two versions of myself, the relationship version, and then the real version that I'm sharing with my friends and my family, okay. then that's not as successful. Do you have any thoughts about about? success in relationship yes yeah. yeah. so I'm the same way I, I feel like the the more I learn myself I'm complete like it's funny like I am myself wherever I, I've gotten to the point where I'm not do dupl- I don't hide things like pretty much I am this is how I am with my my assistant my my mm-hmm. lovers like I I share all of myself so to me success is absolutely being authentic being real and at this point in life it's like I'm not looking to have kids and start a family. Like that's not, not the stage I'm at, but I want someone who can be a good partner and who's done their work. I tell them where, what I've done. Like it's important to me they've had therapy or they have some kind of practice where they've done their work. And so success for me is, yeah, I guess it's, I always show up myself. I mean, more and more so. Um, but I think it's communicating often, not, I don't know. I guess this is how I've been successful lately. Just not, not, yeah, being real about what I want and who I am and then being real who they are and not putting up any of those like, oh, well, maybe I'll just be, this will be good for a while. Like things have to really fill me up. I have to have a real connection with someone. Like it's not just about the sex. Like I've had enough sex, right? You're like, oh, you can be friends are trying to fix me. Like, you should go have sex with him. He wants to have sex. I'm like, I don't need to just go have sex. Sex isn't just about banging. And no, I want like the real like heart connection. Like to me, great sex is like that spiritual, emotional connection it's not even about penetration or even genitalia like it's emotional and spirit and it's like are we good Mm. people can we be good lovers can we be good partners and if we're not okay and if we are okay but it's like real like going into that like none of the bullshit I don't have time for any of that so it's and it's funny because I what I've learned about sex is that it gets the sex doesn't have to be that hard like that stuff you can figure out like I feel like I could have good sex with 
anything. Like I know how to do that now. It's more of like, it's so much more than sex. Like I should talk, my show could be like love with Emily or like relationships with Emily because the sex I got down, I got down the technical part for myself, yourself, anyone, we can make it work pretty much. Everyone's going to leave happy. But the relationship part of it is the part that I am really fascinated with right now. And I think I'm doing my best to have success by being honest and truthful and authentic about what I want and being okay if it's not what they want. Mm, that's very important. I love that. What was the thing that you were just obsessed with toy wise or activity wise back in those days? Um, I love playing. It's so funny. You ask. I love playing with my Barbie dolls. Mm -hmm. I did. And I used to like have them go on dates, like Barbie and Ken. <laughs> I, didn't like Ken. I didn't think Ken was her guy. So I used to steal my brother's GI Joe because I thought he was more, he was more attractive. He seemed more like Barbie's type. I felt right. And Ken was too much of the good guy. Ken was just not interesting to me at all. Um, and but GI Joe had it going on. Um, I and I used to make them clothes. I used to I remember hours like making clothes and like sewing clothes for them and um, just playing games. I mean, in my in my room, like stories and building like furniture out of cardboard. And I think I played a lot. Ah, I remember playing a lot with my Barbies. I haven't thought about this, so that's what I did. And uh, what else did I play with? What was it about the Barbies that you, was it like your imagination that you got to explore or exactly. what was it that drew you to, to that? I don't know what's interesting because when I think about that, those were like the first toys I remember. I mean, I liked mm -hmm. board games and all that, but I think it was that I liked creating stories between like Barbie and her friends and Barbie. And I was always very social growing up. I always had a lot of, so my mom was just visiting me for 18 days from Michigan. So she was telling mm -hmm. me like, you were always so social and I just loved my friends. So I think I used to just like Barbie would have all of her friends and they'd all wear different outfits. And then I remember liking like Barbie and Ken going on a date and having them like kiss and stuff. I remember that at a very young age. Um, I think I just, I think I could get lost in the imagination of making scenarios happen, like creating, like they're going to go camping or they're going to go to a party and doing their hair. It's such a girly thing, but I was, just kind of liked creating a world in my room and mm. my house. And I just remember there would be hours, like I'd be down there, my mom would be like, Emily, dinner, you know, and there'd just be, I remember out of toilet paper actually making dresses and tape and making everything. I think it was just creating different activities that were fun and the relationships between Barbie and her friends and Barbie and G.I. Joe once we kicked out Ken, so. Was it just you and your older brother and your parents? Yeah, it was. Mm -hmm. just us and and then my parents got divorced when I was around eight or nine so mm -hmm. maybe that's why I wanted to stay in my room and create happy stories I, don't know. <laughs> I hadn't made that connection um what were some of the the philosophies or or the life lessons or memorable sayings that you heard echoed in your house uh growing up assuming that maybe you were with your mom sometime and your dad other times um, the first thing that came up for me was only boring people get bored because I'd say, mom, I'm bored. And she'd say, only boring people get bored. I was like, well, I don't want to be boring. Um, I remember, um, it's so funny to say this because I do have a list of all my mom's quotes that I've been writing up lately. Um, she says like, uh, what else was there? Um, I have so many, it's so hard to ever think in this moment. She would just be like, Hold on. Can I look? I have a list. Here. Yeah, yeah. No, we, we take, take time to look. Because I think she's really interesting. My mom is like really funny. Um, mom quotes. I was writing this down because I was creating a book for her for her birthday. I don't know where they are. Okay. I won't overthink this, but I remember that. I remember um, there wasn't a lot though. Like there were sort of like quotes floating around. It was more about like be independent or take care of yourself or you know, those were the kind of messages. It was like, you know, I didn't have a lot of direction and guidance growing up. There wasn't a lot of parental support in the way that I think I could have, I would have thrived under, but it was just, I think everyone was sort of out for themselves. Mm. Loving, my mom was loving and my dad, my mom, they were in their own world. I mean, I guess I understand it now, you know what that was going on, but I don't remember a lot of guidance. 
so you and I are on the same, um, we are in the same age range. And I remember growing up in Alabama, um, my dad had a stack of playboys that he hid in the closet. He wasn't really, I don't think he was really hiding them necessarily. That's just where he kept them. And, uh, and I remember one day I was watching television with my brothers, my three brothers. We were like age, I don't know, 12 down to seven. And he just comes in one day from work and he puts a box of condoms on the television. And then he walks into his bedroom. He didn't say anything about it. Um, that was it. And then later on, my mom got us this book called Our Bodies, Ourselves, which yeah. had these drawings of naked yeah. people in different stages of life. So that was my exposure to the birds and the bees. I'm curious, what was your exposure growing up to the birds and the bees? I that on the podcast about the Playboys. I remember this. Um, my exposure, honestly, I did not have, I don't remember all I remember is sex ed class in seventh grade, mm. and it was two days, and it was boys and girls, and the teacher talked, you know, had the pictures of up on the wall of like the, you know, pelvic floor, the ovaries, and how everything works, and it talks about menstruation, and then I remember one kid in class raised his hand and said, can you fuck underwater? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the teacher was like, I don't even remember what she said. Yes, no. But I would say now, yes, you can, but you still need protection and lube was what I would answer. But I just remember that and everyone giggled and it was a very uncomfortable class. And I don't remember much else. And there was what, what about with your friends, though? Did you talk about things with your friends? Nope. I think how we talked about it was more like, do you like this boy? Do you not like this boy? And then like in high school, did you have sex? Did you not? Did you kiss? Did you not? But there was never anything about pleasure for sure. There was never anything about what we wanted or what felt good. And we definitely didn't talk about masturbation. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that it was a thing until my twenties, which I don't understand that either. But I think I do understand actually why, but I, yeah, I didn't have, I, I really wasn't exposed. I, I was interested in, you know, I always liked my mom. I always had crushes on boys when I was like a little girl. I liked, always liked meeting men, whatever. But I, no, I didn't have any um, information that helped. So when you were in high school and you were like, I guess you were talking to guidance counselors and stuff about college, like what did you see yourself becoming? You know what I've realized is that I didn't have a big, I think when I was younger, it's so funny. I love that what you're doing here because I did have a big imagination when I was little. I'd play with the toys and the girl, the Barbies and I was always writing books, I had these little storybooks. But I think that I had a lot of trauma that came out after my parents got divorced when I was eight. And then my mom got remarried like three months later. And I had this really abusive stepfather that moved into our house. Mm -hmm. And I was with, so from age 10 to 14 was a very, and again, this goes back to why my brother, I mean, we, we just probably just we were in survival mode. It was, um, it was a really scary time in my life. And I think that knowing what we know about trauma or what I've learned, I think I got into a, a mode of like survival of like what's being, I'm a very present person. Ironically, I mean, I also have ADD, but when I'm with someone, I'm like the most present, which is why side note, I don't like, so people like, Oh, why do you take a picture of social media? I don't, I don't really enjoy like capturing my presence. Cause when I'm present with somebody, that's my most like that's where I get filled up and feel connected. So anyway, I think that I, so that was a hard time. And then I got in high school and I, I don't think I had the skill set to plan for the future and even think what that meant because I think it was a very day-to-day -day living. It was like day-to-day, -day, can I get to high school? Can I do all the things? And so I remember that I didn't do very well in high school, my freshman and sophomore year. And I didn't understand the notion of like grades mattering or college was even a thing. It just, again, there wasn't a lot of like, you got to take the LC PSATs or you got to, you know, it was just, so I was constantly surprised by deadlines and things that were coming up. And so I would college counselor, I just knew that I had bad grades. And then my mom threatened me and said, you're not going to buy a car. So I was, but I was always worked. I've had a job since I was 14 and I was saving up to buy a car. And then my mom, parents were going to split it with me because you need a car in the suburbs of Detroit. 
Right. And so then she said to me, you got really bad grades. We're not going to help with your car if you don't get better grades. So that was the one thing. I remember this being the switch in my brain. And that was the, the, the moment I remember going, oh, well, that's a consequence. I have to be able to drive. And then I just started studying. And then I got all A's. I just put my attention down. And then I just wanted to get into a good college. But I don't think, and that was like, I don't think I knew what I wanted to do at all. So I, the point is, I didn't have any idea. But when I went to college, I still, it was very hard for me to pick a major. So my sophomore year, they were like, you have to pick a major. You have like five minutes left, like do it. And I was like, how do I know what I want to be when I grow up if, if I haven't done anything? Like I've worked in clothing stores and I was a cocktail waitress in college, but I don't know. So I chose psychology because I was, I liked my psych 101 class. I thought it was really interesting to understand the human condition. And, and then, and then, so yeah, that's so that, but I, in high school, I had no, I don't, I don't have any memories of me knowing what I wanted to do is the long answer there. And why'd you choose poli sci? What, what, what was that from? Psychology and poli- So what happened was I chose psychology because I enjoyed psychology. I enjoyed the classes, but then I, my, I took a class in politics, want poli sci my junior year. And I loved it. I was like, how do I not know all of that? I, I just felt, always felt like I just, I didn't really know what was going on in the world. It felt so important to me to understand our, 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 our judicial system, our judicial system, can't say that word, and our politics and why we vote and all the things. And, and at the time there was only two women in the Senate and there was like 10 women in Congress. And I was struck by that, how there was no, why aren't any women running for office? Like I got very impassioned. So my junior year, I went to go work for my congressman in DC and I decided that I was going to go into politics. So then I like kind of double majored, but I really didn't. Like, I think my Wikipedia says I had a double major, but it was sort of like a junior major, if that's what you're referring to. So it was poli sci psychology. And, um, and so that felt very like important that why weren't women being left out of the process? Like, why weren't we represented? And so that after that internship, I decided that I wanted to work for women running for office. And so that led me, so I was through college and then my dad died at the end of my, so it was very tragic. My dad was 49 and had a heart attack mm-hmm. and he died. Like it was a sudden, one of those phone calls you get when you're like, what? You know, and I was close, my parents were divorced, but I was, my dad was, that was also difficult because he got married through, he was married three times and it was messy. The whole thing was messy growing up because it was like, there wasn't really a safe space growing up because my dad had wives that didn't like me or my brother. And so anyway, but he died and it was awful. As you can imagine, like you just, your whole life changes. It still is. I always think of my life as like before my dad died and after it's sort of a split. And so then I, uh, where was I going with that? My dad, my junior. Oh, so I have a question about your dad dying though. I'm curious what your idea of success was before your dad died and then how it changed after your dad died in the, in the moments. I mean, not, not in the moment you got the news, but you know, losing someone at a young age like that can give you a different perspective on what life is about. Yeah. I think what I, what I, it's funny. What I remember, what, what I remember feeling was that my dad was so young and people kept saying to me, he's so young, he's so young. And I was like, really? You, know, you don't know how young 49 is until you're in <laughs> right. really friggin' young. And I remember thinking that, you know, you always hear those sayings like life is not a dress rehearsal and live each mm-hmm. day like it's your last because you don't know what could happen. And I, I, I really thought about the fact that I don't think that my dad was a lawyer and I don't think he loved being a lawyer. And it's ironically, well, this is another, this is an amazing twist, but my dad was a DJ in college and he loved radio. And he decided to become a lawyer because there was no money in radio. And he always used to walk around the house and interview us like in his radio voice, like this is JM in the AM. And we have all these recordings of us. So, so I kept thinking like, I, what felt the most, what I think I learned from that was like, I, it was really important to me to do something that I, that I was passionate about and that I loved doing mm-hmm. and something that could have an impact in the world because I knew I'd always be, my mom always raised me. She was like, never rely on a man to take care of you. You can't rely on anybody. Like you got to do it yourself. So I thought if I'm going to be working my entire life, what is something that 
I can get my head around. Like, what is something that's going to be interesting? Because I don't want to slog off to work like my dad being a lawyer. And I don't want to do something that I'm not interested in. Because I also knew myself well enough to know I can't fake it. Like, I, I can't fake anything. Except for the time I still faked orgasms. But I can't fake my connection to people. I can't. If I like you, you know. And if I don't, I just, that's just how it is. So I thought, so I went on this pursuit and it took me about a long time, a decade at least, to find what my what it was. So I kept pivoting. I tried politics. I tried all these things. So I think what I got from my dad was that, like, you don't know what could happen to you. My dad was healthy. He was living a healthy life. He took care of himself and he had a heart attack that they just couldn't. So I thought if life is so precious and so fleeting, I really want to make my time here count. Awesome. Well, listen, I want to wrap this up by looping back around in childhood with you. I've done. Wow. With you, you playing these, these, um, playing house with your Barbie dolls for hours and hours by yourself in the room. And, um, and uh, growing up with a dad who, who would, interview you and having this amazing work ethic after you realize about consequences and then learning how to not take no for an answer, working in politics and making anything happen, anything is possible. I mean, it just, it's fascinating to me every time I've done one of these conversations, how everything sort of plays a role in, uh, in someone's path. And there's literally no throwaway moments. There's no throwaway relationships. Like all of these things inform us. And uh, so anyway, yeah, I just wanted to acknowledge you for being so open and and vulnerable in this conversation and for just continuing to say yes as many times as you did, particularly when you became, um, you know, more of an adult, you know, it's, it's easy to, to think about somebody taking these kind of risks when they're in their 20s, but when you're in your 30s, and when you're in your 40s, you know, moving to L.A. with four thousand dollars in your 40s is not for a lot of people. It's not something they aspire towards, you know, but but I think looking at you now, and what's going on now, people would say, oh, yeah, I would love to be like sex with Emily. I would love to have that. But but would you really love would you be able to go through all of the things that she's gone through in order to get to this point? So thank you for that example and for inspiring all of us who hear yeah. this story to keep going, no matter how old you are, no matter how much money you have, if you believe in what you're doing, if you believe that you're helping people, then that is all you need to keep taking the next step and the next step and the step after that. So thank you very much. If you like that video, you're gonna love the next one. Click this thumbnail right here and I'll see you over there.